<laughs> it already feels quite weird to be, um, you know, so virtual. It feels a bit like science fiction, not because we're using the technology, but because the technology is the only thing we can use. <laughs> you know, so it, it kind of feels weird to be seen and heard, but I'm not seen and hearing. Um, so you want me to begin the reading, right? Yes, please. Okay. All right. So, um, hello, everybody. Thanks for being here um, in this strange virtual space. I am going to be reading from a, a, an ex, two, two short excerpts, I hope short, from the beginning of A Tall History of Sugar. Um, it kind of set the frame. You could almost think of this section as a kind of prologue. Um, to what happens to my main character, Moshe, um, as the book progresses. And this section is called Before the Found Child. I'm just reminding you, um, if you know anything about the, the book, if you read it or read of it, that it's couched as a fairy tale. And I hope that helps to explain how I begin. Long ago, when teachers were sent from Britain to teach in the grammar schools of the West Indian colonies, it was Great Britain then, not Little England, as it is now after Brexit and the fall of empire. They lived in Jamaica near a town called Orokbessa on Sea, a poor fisherman and his wife who was a farmer and a seamstress. And one morning they found a pale child in bushes in a basket made of reeds. The man's name was Noah Fisher, and his wife's name was Rachel. They adopted the child and named him Moshe, which is to say Moses, which in translation means drawn out. And they named him in this way because Rachel was a Yahweh's and because the bushes in which they found him were a tangle of sea grapes running low as a reed bed along the ground on cliffs above the sea. And when she found him, for it was she who first saw the child, the spray from below had made a pool around the basket so that in another few moments it would have sailed, which is to say that in a manner of speaking, the little boy was indeed drawn out of water. The grandmother, a long-headed woman of the countryside tells me, you don't need figure this up. You do not need this long explanation of watery origins since the ancestors of every Jamaican came over the sea, most of them in the ship's caca. And moreover, are we not an island surrounded by water? So anyone born and found here is a child of water and no more to be said. But this child that was found did not look like anyone who came over in the holes of ships 300 years ago. So it is important to give all the details of his name and how he was found. The morning on which this happened was not unusual in the pattern of Noah and Rachel's lives. It was a Friday, the day when they joined the long lines of sick and ailing from the town and its surrounding districts who traveled to the parish's one hospital, mostly on foot, to get treatment for their ailments and wounds. The lines included women pregnant with their first, second, third, sometimes 10th, 11th, or even 12th child. It included men with machete chops all over their bodies from plantation disputes, children bent in the shape of safety pins from hookworm, young ones with yaws, whooping cough, measles, or mumps the usual maladies of childhood in those times and in that place, and many young and old suffering from heart failure, blocked tube, hernia, unresponsive male organ, under-responsive female organ, testicular edema, old fresh cold, virulent fresh cold, consumption, out of control blood pressure, and various disorders from the surfeit or indigestion of sugar. The extent and variety of ailments from saccharine indigestion on the island were both miraculous and unsurprising. In case this is unknown to you, Jamaica from its infancy had been a sugarcane plantation where people perforce ate a lot of sugar or its byproducts and leftovers. Sugar in the boiling houses made the slaves drunk. The great vats of it with its licorice smell when it was in the making. And when it was made, the shining crystals cooked into vast kegs for shipping to England, the mother country. The grains clung to their skins and got into their eyes and ears and even their secret parts, their vulvae and their scrotums. And that was the reason some could not have children, the grandmother said. 
After the long cruel hours in the cane piece being bitten by a cane rat, sugar snake, overseer whip, hot sun and cane leaf, when they went back to their slave cabins at night, there was sometimes nothing to eat but sugar. But they could not eat it without becoming sick, or rather more sick, since they were already sick in the beginning from too much consanguinity with its sweet stickiness. This is why it became a saying in Jamaica, is one of two things why it take you. If it's not sugar, is heart failure. Which might boil down to the same thing. For heart failure comes from eating too much salt. Salt for healing, for taste, even your tea. Salt for feeling balanced. Salt for good luck, throw it behind you. Salt for counteracting obia and the ill effects of sugar. In Jamaica, once upon a time, and maybe still now, we ate salt like sugar, against sugar. So it still goes back to King Sugar. Noah was among the patients sick by sugar. He had on the inside of his right thigh a long running diabetic sore that had to be hospital dressed every Friday morning. Though after many years of dressing, it still had not healed. Rachel accompanied him, accompanied him on these trips to the hospital because he could not read or write, but she could. And sometimes there were papers that he was required to read and sign. So I'm going to skip. Yeah. Lost inside her quiet scream, it was a while before Rachel was able to discern the sound of the child's crying above the tumult. A high wail, and then an insistent shrieking in short, sharp bursts. It broke through the surface of her mind and pushed her towards a clump of sea grape trees that lay tangled among the maca. Strange looking trees. Instead of standing tall against the wind as sea grapes normally do, they lay low, hugging the ground. They were several yards from the hospital building. The knotty trail they made among the maca was difficult to walk through. Nobody walked there. If a person wanted to urinate or make quick furtive love, they stayed close against the side of the clinic where the ground was smooth and baked. Only children hankering to eat the rich purple fruit that covered the branches in August ever went among the sea graves. But that was where the sound was coming from. Rachel followed the cries until she caught sight of bright red cloth among the tangle. With sea spray in her eyes, she thought at first there was a woman crouched on the ground. The woman in a blue cambric dress was thrashing her baby as she struggled with one hand to release her breast to put it in the baby's mouth, while with the other she hoisted up her skirt to piss. Then Rachel's vision cleared and she saw that no woman except herself was there. She saw the basket with the baby's tiny legs kicking above the piece of scarlet cotton that had been tucked around him on both sides. She saw the milk blue skin exposing the tracery of veins, the wisps of snow hair that later resolved itself into the famous two-tone bush, wild blonde in front and jet black behind, the old man's wrinkled cheek that all newborns have, red with pain and rage as he screamed. The left side of his face was hidden against the padding in the basket, which was in danger of stifling him. From his size and the timbre of his crying, Rachel, who had helped her mother raise eight children, could tell at once that the child was newborn. The basket had been padded with great care. It seemed in a pitiful effort to make him comfortable. It even had a bonnet-shaped canopy to shield him from the sun. But it had not shielded him from the line of black ants that were crawling over him and causing his cries. Rachel ran the last few steps. Frantically, she began brushing off the ants in the same motion with which she lifted the child out of the makeshift cradle. With savage instinct, the baby snuffled against her breast, searching for the promise of comfort he was programmed to recognize before he even left the womb. He had been dressed in a small girl's bloomers and what looked like torn off pieces of a red sheet, as though no preparation had been made for his birth. Swaddling cloths, Rachel thought, as the wide waistband of the panty shifted and she saw he was a boy. The ants had begun to eat his foot, but even that pain had faded in the greater pain of his hunger as he snuffled for food. Not finding where to suckle, he began screaming again. Rachel rocked her body to and fro to quiet him while turning the little face toward her to see further what manner of child this could be. What she saw of the rest of the face made her hide it in pity in her shawl. 
There are moments in life when something, some object or vision or encounter moves a person in the heart with such force that the future, that is to say, one's way of looking at it is changed forever. No course of action presents itself. And so without condition, the heart surrenders. Something irrevocable gives over. Such is the irresistible arrest. In the unique recognition of helplessness, the knowledge that there is nothing in the universe that could ever be done, no sphere of influence within which one has the power to act, we reach blindly for the familiar. For Rachel the Yahwehist, when she saw the child's indescribable face, this was such a moment. This she told me many years later, when she saw I finally understood that I had no power over him. And Rachel Fisher, a cursing woman in whom faith had the force of superstition, kneeled down on the ground there with a the found child in her arms and prayed. The baby fell quiet. When she got up off her knees and looked at his face again, she smiled, a slow, astounded, beatific smile, and decided to say nothing to anyone about what had happened in that translucent moment when it became clear that she and the found child had been lifted for an uncountable moment out of time. Moses, she whispered, Moshe, and again, Moshe. Then she added, as if in defiance of some objecting voice that only she heard, you name Moshe, because I draw you out of the water. As you can see, this account of how she found him was not accurate, but it was Rachel's account, the one that was told throughout Moshe's early life. And I'm just going to add one last excerpt from that beginning chapter. Um, in addition to carrying the weight of new translations on his birth certificate, Moshe carried in his body outlandish signs of illegitimacy, the peculiar transgressions from which rumor had it he was made. Please understand, in that country, illegitimate, illegitimate did not mean what it means to you not born out of wedlock, which most of the people were, but born from terrible occasions that placed their mark on you. If you were born out of wedlock, you were simply a bastard. Nearly everyone there was a bastard. Illegitimate was something else to, altogether, a curse. With his pale skin, one sky blue and one dark brown eye, his hair long, wavy and bleached blonde in front and short black and pepper grainy in back, the kind of pepper grainy that people call bad here or nigger head. The child seemed to represent some kind of perverse alchemy that had taken place in the deep earth between tectonic plates where he was fashioned. People said the boy just looked like sin, big sin at work when he was made. For why else had the crossing come out in him, not as a judicious mixture of yellow gold skin, in between here, pretty here, and a singular eye color, either black or brown, or the two blended for hazel, pussy eye or even sea green blue, which sometimes happened even in children with black skin, as it did in the boy Brendan, the Welsh's son from Tuella. Furthermore, what a skin, the color of milk that had been watered, so pale and thin it gave off a sheen of translucent blue, like certain types of coral or small swimming fish, the kind we call gray angel fish, though they were not gray, but grayish blue. Skin hair, eyes, enigmas. Only in Moshe's infant face, there was no equivocation. It was uncompromisingly a nigger face. But what people did not know, even the most clairvoyant, was the face that Rachel saw the first time she picked up her son. This was something that she pondered in her heart and kept secret even from her own husband until the day of her death. It had not been a nigger face. Okay, I'm gonna leave that there. Thank you so much for that. For those of you who are there, welcome again to Bios and Bookmark, a reading series featuring Caribbean movies. And we're joined today Forbes, who has just read a beautiful excerpt from her fifth book, A Tall History of Earth, published by Akashic Books. And it has also 
long listed for this year's OCM Bocas Prize in Caribbean Literature. Kidala, welcome. Again. Thank you very much. Me very glad to be here. <laughs> and um, thanks again for those of you who are tuning in. Yes. And to have guests from many areas. So welcome to them. I am conscious that we may be doing the data feedback still, but mm -hmm. once you can understand fine, we're going to press on for that if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So Cadella, are you able to hear me? Are you able to hear me fine? I can hear you and I can work out, you know, the ends of the sentences. So <laughs> let's go with it. Yes. Okay, I might just to see how can take off my video if that gives us more bandwidth. Okay. So in speaking about a tall history of Shiva, people have said and spoken about its marvelous powers. Where do you think mapping the world or the beginnings of that world came from? Is it a question for me? Yes. Okay, where did mapping the beginnings of the world come from? Um, many directions. Uh, I would, okay, let, let me start with this, with, with what I've always insisted on, um, you know, as, you know, one of my, part of my response when I talk about the book, is that it is couched as a fairy tale, but it is also very much a very accurate history, I think, um, of Jamaica in the period which it is said you're looking at starting in the 1950s, just before independence um, in 62 and coming straight up, you know, quite a few years to, to almost the present time. And it's a world that is framed by the the kinds of stories I grew up here, you know, hearing the way people told stories where I came from was very much part of the landscape. Um, you know, people would say we, we talk when we tell doppy stories or we tell ordinary stories as though it's a doppy, they're doppy stories. So that kind of world in which there was no separation between what you might call the naturalistic everyday world that you see with your, well, I wouldn't even say physical eyes because we saw things with our physical eyes that some people might say you know, didn't exist in naturalistic time. But that, that sort of absence of a barrier between um, the naturalistic and what some people call the otherworldly um, was very much part of, of, of the way I grew up, I think, in the countryside in Jamaica. And um, it's, it's, so it's both a combination of that world, both in storytelling modes and the, the everyday experience of the world itself. And um, the fact that I've always been intrigued by fairy tales that I grew up with. And um, I, I, I've always thought that fairy tales are not really fairy tales, they are the alternative histories that the people tell the one that are not the ones that are not getting into the history books, you know, <laughs> by the powerful, so to speak, another way of looking at what really happened. And I just thought, well, that just feels like um, how we've lived. It's a world marked by some of the most outlandish remnants, even now, of the outlandish enterprise at colonization and slavery was, but also very much marked by that extraordinary riches of, the, of, of, of Jamaican people's imaginative capacity, which comes out in even something like Tony Hanmek fashion, which is really a way of saying that you make do with what you have and you take bits and pieces and scraps and make the, the most glorious dress you could ever see, you know? So it's a world which, which is sort of, is in that kind of space, which is very real. But um, you, I guess you, you experience it through different lenses than 
you know, sort of, you know, I, I can't find the words, you know, I hate to say realist because um, somebody had written, wanted to write a blurb on the book that said it was marvelous realism. I said, no. And she said, find a phrase. And I couldn't, I said, okay, I'll go with mythic realist. But it was very, I didn't even like that label because, you know, but but I suppose it, it fits it more there that we inhabited. This, this is a world I, you know, I grew up understanding. You know, my mother said, to, I asked my mother once, why does Sammy look up, always look up in the sky? This was a guy we um in my village who always looked up in the sky, never looked down. And my mother just said, well, River Mama take him away, stole him and kept him for 21 days. And when he came back, that was her mark on him. It made perfect sense to me. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, so that's the world, you know, it, it's, it's a very historically marked world, um, you know experienced in in ways that uh, you know expand those boundaries as the book is described or compared to Agassiz yeah but I feel that in the way it contends with history mm -hmm. with love with masking of the self beyond ideas of magical realism. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I love Marquez. Um, he's one of the people who gave me permission to write the way I actually write, you know? Um, you, you, you have these crazy things in your head and you say, well, you know, <laughs> you know, nothing that you're reading really looks like it, you know? And then, you know, you read someone like Marquez or some like Erna Broadbow who writes differently from me too. And I say, okay, okay, I can do this. <laughs> you know, and nobody's going to laugh, you know? So in that sense, I, you know, he, I, I owe him a great debt. But I, we are coming from different experiences, similarities, of course, but very different. It's interesting about Marquez because he grew up on the Caribbean coast of Colombia, and he always said, you know, very often said, "I'm Caribbean," so he obviously, you know, sees that, that a kind of connection. But yes, I, it's 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 you know the the final influence is me, <laughs> you know, you know it's um, my my view of the world, and um, I I set out to write this story in a way thinking I'm going to throw all caution to the wind and I'm going to write and not that I've ever really paid a lot of attention to any scriptures about writing but but this one I went on and I said I'm going to write the kind of book I really enjoy reading I want a love story <laughs> you know I still read fairy tales <laughs> you know <laughs> and children's books you know and I go over them to see if I, they you know they, they, you know, they fascinate me as they did when I was a child. And um, I wanted it to be very historically accurate. Um, so, so and, and of course, there are other things that made me, that, that pushed me towards this. The way Moshe is constructed is somebody who doesn't seem to have a race that you can assign him to. I, that was very, very, very deliberate. It was actually the thing that kept, like the worm in my head, the obsession that I couldn't get rid of. And it's because I live in the United States. And, you know, I, I think nearly everybody who comes from the Caribbean encounters the shock at some time or other in the US, you know, that race plays a, a much different role than it does in the Caribbean. It's like you're surrounded by it all the time. It's, it's free, it's everything. Everything is filtered through that lens. And it, it, it is the reality of the place, but I, I got to a point where there's this, and I always write it off a kind of rage. <laughs> the rage in my head was, well, suppose it was somebody born whose race you couldn't tell, what then? And it seemed, you know, it, it was interesting to place him in, in Jamaica, not in say the Jamaican diaspora, because, you know, I think, you know, our, relationship with race is much more complicated, but I think we're also, certainly in rural Jamaica at any rate, much more open to difference. And that could be a bit of a paradox, you know, everything carries its own contradiction. So it would be interesting to place him in a place which was used to seeing complications, you know, of, 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 of physical appearance in terms of, you know, racial phenotype, and yet be stunned and unable to place this guy and so, so that that part of that comes out of my, you know, that experience here, as well. And um, I've also always wanted to write the story of the kind of sexual um, 
depredations <laughs> and these, you know, that took place in some of these colonial schools. It's one of the things that I thought, you know, have not been spoken enough about. And I wanted to, to write that. So yeah, those, those are, you know, so yeah. And it's a novel that takes us right up into the, the burning heart of Brexit and of the Trump era. What's it like to think about your own work now in a setting that has become globally even more uncertain than it was at the time this book was published? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it takes some thinking about, doesn't it? Um, we have the, the issue of race and the issue of difference. The, those have always been very virulent and, and you know, fiery in the US, I think more than ever with those kinds of events that are taking place now, even in the ways um, the, you know, cutting off of, of aid from, of, of, of funding from WHO does, has to affect people of color, you know, and people who are, you know, not, American, you know, um, you know, all those different ways, um, you know, it, it, it gives you, it, it, I think it resonates a lot now. And um, part of the, the wide art that I begin with when I talk about, it's not, you know, it's different, it was different then from it is now after Brexit and the fall of empire. And of course, later when I talk about, you know, I make a, a weave from when Moshe goes to um, to Bristol and he's looking at everything and saying, you know, he doesn't understand that. This is Ari, the narrator, you know, responding to things he's saying, say he's crazy, he doesn't realize that years later, this is going to be a different, this scenario is going to be there as well when, when they elect Donald Trump. And I say all of that to say that, you know, part of the, the opening sentences of the book is a sense of irony. You know, long ago, once upon a time, but it's really still now. <laughs> yeah, in different iterations. Yeah, so yeah, I, I think it's a very timely book in that way, although I didn't plan for it to, <laughs> to be when I started it. <laughs> <laughs> book is a real blessing in terms of how it it fully involves history while also like unsparingly and yet romantically and yet in a fabulous way dealing with the here and now and and reading Moshe was I think it's safe to say he's unlike any other character I've ever seen which which is something pretty astounding. And I was very drawn to his sense of drawing on filters, whether of, of Ariane or of art or of other kinds of masking to survive. And I wondered if we could speak a little bit about that. Okay. Um, yeah, if, 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 if it feels kind of nice to hear you say that he's like, unlike any other character <laughs> you've ever encountered, because that was, part of my aim. I have a friend who actually said that, you know, she could imagine Aryan very easily physically, but she couldn't imagine motion. Said, okay, that means I did what I wanted to do because that's, that's exactly the enigma I want to get across because you know how, and, and it's both to say, well, if we can't pigeonhole people, that's an easy, you know, first question. What are we gonna do then? But more than that, to think of him as, <laughs> in a way, he's a character I've been mean, unfair to because he, you know, he carries in himself the like a portmanteau sort of a lot of the the issues about difference, <laughs> you know, that that we talk about in, from in multiple directions, from many directions. He's um, <laughs> but but the, the whole thing of of masking in a way you could think of what he does as not just filter filtering other through other people's perspectives and words, but also that he he performs a kind of masking. It's like, you know, different veils 
that he has to use because there's no one language that is accessible to him. And um, so even his inability to speak is part of that because how, how is he spoken? How is somebody like that spoken? And how does somebody like that speak so he can be understood? And so you reach after veils of representation, you know, so to speak, you're like reaching, okay, you know, this, this piece, you know, okay, this red piece will give a little, you know, bit of him, this green piece will give a little bit of him, that kind of thing. And in the end, what you get is this sense of trying to articulate what is not articulable, you know, so, so that that's part of what I was aiming to do. And, and his, his, but I also wanted to make him very relatable, different, but also that you, you could see him so intensely and see that he was human, you know, like the rest of us and feel some of what he feels, you know, and, you know, he's not some outlandish person out there. He's a real human being who bleeds when he's hurt, you know. If you cut him, he will bleed. If you shoot him, he will die, you know. He hurts, you know, he, he thinks like other people. He's diffident, he's scared, he's, he wants to look brave, all of that kind of thing. So um, in, his, in, his, in his extreme, um, impossibility <laughs> you know he's probably everybody <laughs> in that sense you know and, and I hadn't thought about him that way actually no that's one of the things about interviews you end up saying something you say am I going to hate myself for saying this about my character later on <laughs> am I writing another book in responding to the interview <laughs> you know <laughs> but there it is you know yeah yeah I, I guess I feel that a lot of people would um would not be upset at all at the idea of a sequel. I don't know if it's anything you've ever considered because this is your fifth novel. And so do you feel that, I think this is a question I've been wondering, do you feel there's a way in which your novels now, there being five of them, speak to each other? Do they have a language among themselves? Are they in a kind of shared and, and harmonious or unharmonious community now? That's a fascinating question. And some are not novels, you know, like a permanent freedom is a set of short stories which are linked. I've always been sort of toying around with it, with this space between novel and short story and doing all sort of strange things with them, I think. Um, some are experimenting that way. Um, yeah, well, they are, I think what is in terms of the conversation among them, I, I think I've increasingly moved away from the realist mode of writing and more into the, the, the skin I'm comfortable in. And I think this, in that sense, they, they, there's a conversation going on among them. Um, uh, one of the obvious things, of course, in addition to that is the way I have very deliberately sought to make the Creole language the language of part of my language of narration and and done different i don't know what you might call it run different changes on it in that way to make it real and also make it different you know i have done that but but in the, i think thematically as well there, there are similarities among them i <laughs> I, I also laugh when you said sequel because you're the third person who's asked me can you please write a sequel and one person says can you make it about Rachel or can you even write a prequel and make it about Rachel and I actually had not thought about it but I'm thinking about it the truth is that I have two other books in my head that I thought would get written until coronavirus 19 happened and it is just such a science fiction at time I, I already have the first page in my head, totally in my head, of a novel about this 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 time. <laughs> so I don't know if there's going to be a sequel. Um, of course, if I get a movie and get filthy rich, I can call in call in rich to work the next morning. <laughs> I might do that, but the, yeah, I'm not ruling out that possibility. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a way though, very quickly, in which. Um, there, my, my, my book before this ghost has a character called the, the dwarf child at the end of it. And a piece of him always nagged me as I felt as though he needed a sequel. So there's a way in which there are connections between him and what he represents 
and um, and Moshe, you know, in in at all history of sugar. So, yeah. All right, for those of you who are now just joining us, um, don't worry, you may have missed a lot, but you can always rewind and review. We're talking bios and bookmarks with Cordella Forbes. It's our online reading series with Caribbean authors powered by the NGC Bookers Lit Fest. At this point, we would love to hear any questions or comments. Please leave them in the comment box on Facebook. And while you think that up, I have an exercise called three envelopes that Cadella knows about. Don't worry, we haven't sprung it on her. So the envelopes are simply numbered one through three. Cadella will choose one. We'll open the envelope and then engage with the question inside. All right, Cadella? Okay. All right. One, two, three. Mm, that sounds like a fairy tale. Now I'm supposed to choose number three, right? <laughs> and especially, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, if, if I choose the one that looks like gold, it will have a grinning devil in it. If I choose the one that looks like silver, it will have a monkey in it. Uh, but you know what? Um, I... Yeah, I'm not going to spin around times three. I think I'm going to go number one. <laughs> fingers crossed, fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, number one. Which character from any of your novels would you least like to be quarantined with during this pandemic? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to see this. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hilarious <laughs> okay um to tell you the truth you know i wouldn't mind living with any of them and i'll tell you why i lived with them for so long in my head while they were in the emerging you know i wouldn't even say creating because i have this thing in my head that they just make themselves and then impress themselves on you you get to know them i live with i live with them you know every day while i was writing them listening to them so i could hear them i slept with them you know share their morning breath you know it with them you know i know all their follies and foggles and everything so there's a part in it all history of sugar where um Moshe says that if you know somebody down to their skeleton, you love them. So I could be comfortable with any of that. I probably want to find out some more. Then you get some sequels. But, <laughs> but if I were thinking about it as a reader, probably the guy in A Permanent Freedom, that collection, the, the story is called um, Nocturne in Blue. He's a rapist. He's a serial rapist, actually. And there are two stories, one called Say and one called Nocturne in Blue. And in Say, the last girl he did that to tells her part of the story. And in Nocturne in Blue, he tells his part. And um, it's just because I like to do sort of disturb safe places and comfortable spaces. I wanted to see if I could write a story um, from the point of view of somebody who does something that I cannot, it's even difficult for me to say the word out loud as a woman um, but I did it and in order to write him not a caricature I had to you know I had to imagine him real uh, obviously if I'm a young girl I'm not going to be quarantined with that guy at all <laughs> 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 yeah that, that's pretty much what I would say there. that's a, a very um, generous answer even considering the worst that, that anyone can be a character or a human being and really there's no difference when you put it like that so thank you for that we have a question from your publisher Johnny Templin he would like to know Cordella have you been able to write at all since the virus kicked in you know, that's a very good question because I have said, I mean, this, this, this thing has been so horrible. Um, I have friends and family. I think about people who are, even people who are migrating, refugees in, in a situation like this, people in homeless shelters. And I think about my family um, back in Jamaica who some of them have to work. And um, I, I, 
and they can't afford not to, you know, people here, I hear, you know, we talk about the nurses and the doctors as a frontline heroes. I think about my supermarket clerk. So it's, a, it's, it's been a terrible thing. We've seen the numbers of people who have lost jobs. Um, but people started looking and saying sort of a version of, it's an ill wind that blows nobody any good. It has to be a really ill wind. They're talking about the earth breathing again and so on. The funny thing is that I actually have more work. I'm teaching online, which means my teaching work low doubles. I'm teaching my six-year-old son at home. Um, they, they, my children get classes on, you know, from their teachers online, but he's just six. So obviously I have to do the work with him. So there's more work, but I also actually have more space in my head because I control the, 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 you know, the timing of work mm -hmm. more um, to write. So um, the, my life has been so extraordinarily hectic um, since a tall history of sugar came out that I, the writing has been very, it's been very difficult. And I'm, I'm beginning again <laughs> properly because of this strange, very, very strange ill wind. I think that ties in perfectly to a question asked by our social media assistant, Alana. And she wants to know if these surreal times we are in now, if they could be said to be inspiring you in any way. That's why I said that the next two books in, in that I had in my head probably are going to give way to this strange <laughs> time because I, I, I can't see how one does not write about it. You know, it's, it's just been pushing itself all over the place in my head. And I am... Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is going to get written. <laughs> it is going to get written pretty soon, I think, yeah. I think we have time if you if you are interested, if you would like to. No, I would love to hear just a little bit more from the book as we look towards closing. That would be wonderful. All right, I could do that quickly. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll read a little bit from, you know, uh, Moshe and Arian become soulmates. I mean, she's, she's a narrator who near the end of the book takes over where the story becomes more heard. You know, they have this telepathic connection. And telepathic seems such a silly word to use. I, 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 yeah, anyway. It's a very difficult thing to find the language to say <laughs> when I want to say, you know, you know you know, about the unusualness of this relationship. But anyway, so I, I'm going to read an excerpt from when they were at school. And because it's kind of emblematic of the kind of relationship they have. That evening, she fought the first of the fights she was to fight on his behalf. The memory of the scary morning came back in full force at the sight of the big boy running in the road. He was throwing a football to another boy and the two of them leaped to catch it while other children scattered out of its way. And the boy shouted his question of the morning again. How oh, that the boy looks so funny like smarty boiling. And his friend snickering called out, boil baby. How strange he looks as if he has been boiled. The friend was pleased with his own wit. Exhilarated, he cried, shouting into the air as he, lift, as, as he leaped after the throne ball. And him look like Maggish to you know, boiled Maggish. And moreover, he looks like maggots, a nest of boiled maggots, communicable in my abominations. The other screamed with laughter, Maggish boy. He bounced the ball over to the two silent children walking hand in hand. The other big boy followed. They planted themselves in the middle of the road, blocking Moshe and the large girl. The two children's hands tightened in each other. The large girl pulled Moshe aside and continued on, walking along the side of the road. The first boy, the boy with the ball, pushed Moshe in his chest. Pick me, how are you? How will you come from? We know about you. Are you the white man, baby, where Miss Rachel find na or a bush? Take your hand off of him. Moshe said in the large girl's voice, you want me to put it on you instead? 
The boy choked her in her chest. He thought Ariane had spoken. Oh, I have to explain something. So the reason the next section, as I read on, you'll hear about Stuart Granger and John Wayne is only because this was in the 50s, so you're not hearing about Jackie Chan. <laughs> okay, or the 60s rather. The large girl let go of Moshe's hand and dropped her books on the ground. The free issue exercise book and the reading book the teacher had loaned her for the day because her first teacher had put her in a different class. She took off her uniform belt and pushed Moshe behind her. And then she bent in the classic elementary school fighting pose, a crouching position like a wrestler, legs played wide, imaginary sleeves rolled up, arms cocked and fists at the ready. And she danced on her feet and brandished her fists like a boxer. And Moshe did not know what happened after that, except that a sudden host of children appeared and began screaming, fight, fight, and jumping up and down and pushing and craning to see who would win. And the crowd quickly swelled and the screams changed to murder, two power and a murder. And then again to why, why the gala win, the gala kill the boy them with licks, with kicks, the gala karate, the boy them. You ever see gala karate, rotted, a John Wayne, a Stuart Granger, boy, uno dead now, uno bitch, uno dead now. And several of them ran back down the road calling out for man teacher, man teacher, and suddenly man teacher was there and so was Mr. Brown. And the two boys were being held by the seat of their pants by man teacher and Mr. Brown. And man teacher was demanding to know what had happened. And the crowd of excited children were calling to tell the story, but Moshe and Arian stood there not speaking, though Arian was panting hard as if she had run a very long race, and her uniform belt and one of her shoes were missing and dirt was on her face, and one of her knuckles was bleeding. And one of the girls found her shoe and helped her put it back on her foot. And the two boys were all swollen in their faces and one of them was holding the front of his pants and crying. And my teacher and Ariane said Ariane and Moshe could go home. And he and Mr. Brown made the two boys walk back toward the school with my teacher and his cane and Mr. Brown in their wake, holding them by the backs of their pants so they could not run away. And it was over and the crowd of children were chattering with awe and excitement and wanting to know where the large girl learned karate like that. And someone said her father, Master George, was a karate king, a black belt from when he was in the Royal Air Force in England. And someone else said, did you know the two of them bright, bright? Teachers keep them today, put them in first class. And another one said, I'm a dundus, but in bright, bright. And someone offered to walk them home, but Arian shook her head no, and some of the children tried to walk them home to spread the news and see what their mothers and fathers would do. But Arian Moshe said, And the children who were offering stepped back, and Arian took Moshe's hand and walked with him home to his mother. Say me carry him home, Miss Rachel, Arian said. May we come for my morning, Moshe said in Ari Arian's voice, speaking Ari Arian's words. I will fetch him again in the morning. Always I will fetch him in the morning. And she waved goodbye and left. And the morning and the evening were the first day. Thank you so much for that. I think that is a beautiful ending to what has been so unavoidably scattered with a few technical difficulties. I think we got the hang of it in the end. And it's been such a pleasure and an honor to speak with you, Cordella. For those of you who are interested in getting A Tall History of Sugar, please do. You can get it, I'm sure, as an ebook on Akashic's websites, Akashic Books. If you don't know about them, you should know about them. They are extraordinary publishers. And thank you again so much, Cordella for being here and being with us. Thank you so much, Yifani, and thank you all for coming, for listening. And um, I, it's my honor, really. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Bukas. <laughs> thank you, Johnny. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's it from us, from everyone who's tuned in. Um, thank you for being with us. If you didn't, you can always catch the recorded episode right here on Facebook. Please stay safe and be well and take care.